you pull out your message notes, today we're ending a series we've been in for several weeks on the life of Jonah. We've been looking at your life mission. I've said this every week. You weren't put on this earth simply to live for yourself. No, 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 you were made for a much greater purpose than you. You weren't put here to just make money, retire, and die. God has a plan and a purpose, and he actually has what's called a life mission for your life. Only you can fulfill your life mission. If you don't fulfill it, you just miss the whole purpose of your life. So what we've been talking about is extremely important. And we've been looking at the manifestation of your life mission. Now I told you there are three ways you can learn about something, like for instance, your life mission. You can learn by explanation, uh, you can learn by um, example, uh, you can learn by experience. You don't have enough time in life to make all the mistakes yourself. It's wise to learn from experience, but it's wiser to learn from the experiences of others than you don't have to make those mistakes. You can learn from people who are more successful. You can also learn from failures and go, I don't want to do that. In the Bible, there's this little book called the book of Jonah, only four chapters. Jonah does almost everything wrong in his life mission. And what we're learning from this story are what not to do with your life. It's in there as a warning saying, don't do it this way. It'll save you a lot of heartache, save you a lot of pain, save you a lot of frustration but you were made for a mission. Now this guy Jonah, he is a rogue prophet. He is a reluctant prophet. He is a resistant prophet. I told you earlier, he was a bigot. He was racially prejudiced. And when God told him, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, which was the largest city in the world at that time, the capital of Assyria, and I want you to proclaim a message to them, he goes, I'm not gonna do it, they're my enemy. They're politically different from me. I don't like those guys, I hate them. I don't want you to bless them, I don't want you to use them, I don't want you to forgive them. And so he runs the opposite direction. Instead of going east to Tarshish, I went east to Nineveh, he heads west to Tarshish, a seaport on the coast of Spain. You know they have the big uh, uh, ship a storm in the, in the ocean, he's thrown overboard, he's swallowed by this giant fish that the Bible says God had prepared, uniquely prepared. He's there in, in that fish, that he turns him around, spits him out in the right direction, and we've been following his life, learning what not to do. Now so far, uh, here's what we've learned. In chapter one, up here on the screen, uh, we saw Jonah rebelling and running from God. He goes, God, I don't wanna do your plan, I wanna do my plan. I don't wanna go with your mission for my life, I wanna just kinda do what I wanna do. Chapter two, we see Jonah repenting and running back to God. And he prays, he goes, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Then last week we looked at chapter three where he's restarting and, and he's running with God. It goes, okay, I'm gonna do it. He has a bad attitude. His attitude stinks, it sucks. But he's doing, at least doing what God tells him to do. Now in this last chapter, we're gonna see Jonah regretting and resenting uh, because God changes the plans and Jonah doesn't like that. What we're gonna look at today is quickly, I wanna review the mistakes that he made that we've seen up to this point point out a couple more mistakes that he made uh, in uh, this chapter, and then look at what to remember when things don't go your way. Because you figured out by now, most of life doesn't go your way. Everything in the world is broken because, because of sin. The economy's, economy's broken, the weather's broken, <clears throat> relationships are broken, your body's broken, nothing works perfectly on this planet and your plans don't work perfectly. A lot of times you make your plans and what happens is the exact opposite. Jonah had his plans for what he wanted God to do. God had his plans, and when God did his plans instead of Jonah's, Jonah gets resentful and, and regretful. Now, uh, we're gonna look at what to remember when things don't go your way, but first I want you to see, first, so far we've seen five mistakes that Jonah made. You don't wanna make these, because these make your life miserable. Number one, Jonah thought, they're on your outline, he thought he could ignore his mission. So he runs from God. Now you can run from God the rest of your life, but then what are you gonna do? You're gonna run into God. You can run from God the rest of your life, then you can't run anymore, and you just wasted your life. Number two, Jonah was prejudiced against people that God created in love. That's gonna always make you miserable. 
if you're, if you're prejudiced, if you're a racist, you're a bigot. Number three, Jonah cared more about his politics than people's salvation. And God says, I want to go save that city called Nineveh. And he goes, no, they're the enemy. I don't want you to save them. He cared more about his politics. By the way, anytime you make an allegiance to your nation greater than your allegiance to God, there's a word for that. It's called idolatry. And it breaks the first two of the Ten Commandments where God says, you're not to have anything before me. I'm to be number one in your life. Okay? Then he says, number four, Jonah was only interested in his nation, not the whole world. That's a mistake. And number five, Jonah reluctantly fulfilled his mission, but he does it with a bad attitude. As we saw last week, he eventually goes to Nineveh and instead of giving a message of love and forgiveness and God wants you to change if you'll turn back to him, he walks in and goes, you guys are gonna die, bye. <laughs> not exactly a positive, popular message and not exactly expressing the love of God. Now, in Jonah chapter four, what we've come to today, we find two more mistakes and both of them involve resentment. Resentment. Because Jonah doesn't get his way, he gets resentful. Now, let me just say here, resentment is the most worthless emotion in your life. Anytime you get resentful, you're going to hurt yourself more than you hurt the person you're resentful against. If I, if I asked you to remember somebody who's hurt you, you could probably pretty quickly bring up somebody in your mind who's hurt you and you've had resentment against them. You think by resenting them, you're holding them accountable. But actually, when, you hold, when you're resenting somebody, all you're doing is make yourself miserable. They're not even thinking about you while you're thinking about them all the time. There are people who hurt you a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago in your life. You're still holding on to that hurt. That's dumb. They can't hurt you anymore unless you hold on to the memory of it. That's called resentment. They're not even thinking about you while you're stewing and spewing and going, I hate the fact that they did that to me and you're going over and over and your mind gets bigger and bigger. They're out there cooking a steak on the barbecue, making homemade ice cream and playing golf. They're not even thinking about you. Who's the miserable one? You. Resentment never helps, it always hurts. You gotta let it go. You gotta let it go. Now, these are the next two mistakes that Jonah makes. I don't want you, because I care about you, because I love you, I want your life to be happy, I want your life to be successful. You gotta get this resentment stuff out of your life. No matter what people have done to you, they can't hurt you anymore unless you hold on to it through resentment. Now, here, uh, now while resentment is, uh, is bad against anybody. The worst kind is when you have resentment against God. And you may have never even thought about this, but you have had times in your life, we all have, where we are resentful against God. God, why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? Why did you let that happen? And you get resentful against God. That causes all kinds of problems. Now here are the two mistakes that Jonah made. I want you to write these down so you don't make them, okay, in your life. Number one is resenting God's plan when it doesn't fit my plan. That's what Jonah did. Resenting God's plan for my life when it doesn't fit my plan for my life. Have you ever done that? Of course you have. You got mad at God when you had a plan and your plan for graduation, for marriage, for that job, for whatever, didn't happen. Resentment is a deadly poison. It's like drinking arsenic and hoping it kills your opponent. It's like aiming a shotgun at yourself and pulling the trigger so you hit your enemy with a kick of the recoil. It's always gonna hurt you more than it hurts anybody else. But resentment against God is especially bad. Now why was Jonah resentful? I'll tell you why, because he wanted his enemies, the city of Nineveh, to be destroyed. God's going, I wanna forgive them. I wanna warn them and hope they'll turn back to me. And God, Jonah's going, I don't want you to forgive them. And so he, he doesn't want God to let him off the hook. In Jonah chapter three, verse 10, the last verse, the last chapter, and first verses of the next chapter, it says this on the screen. When God saw that the people of Nineveh had put a stop to their evil ways, and they, they really were a pretty wicked city, 
Uh, they were kind of like Nazis uh, of that day. They were very, very brutal. Uh, when Nineveh had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and he canceled the destruction he had threatened. Now this change of plans upset Jonah and he became furious. So Jonah complained to the Lord about it. Now, I remember I told you last week that when God warns you about something, you know, if you don't change this, it's gonna be, a, there are gonna be problems, there are gonna be discipline, there'll be punishment. Whenever God warns you, that's a good sign because a warning means I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna discipline you. I don't wanna publish you. I'm just warning you. When God warns you, if you walk off that cliff, you're gonna fall, that's, that's for your good, not for your bad. So a warning actually is God's grace. If God, if God just wanted to punish you, he just punish you. He doesn't warn you, he just does it. And, and so God says, I want you to go to Nineveh and warn them that if they don't straighten up, things are gonna change. Well, that's a symptom that I want to forgive them. And, and, and that's what God wanted to do. Well, Jonah doesn't want that. When God warns, he, he's, Jonah's hoping that he has destruction. So he gets resentful because God decides, I'm gonna forgive these guys because they've turned back to me, so I'm gonna forgive them. Jonah blows a gasket. He gets upset. He, he gets resentful against God. Now, how do you know, you, how do you know when you're resentful at God? You're gonna find five emotions in your life. Write these down. These are signs that subconsciously you are resenting God right now. Number one is frustration. Frustration in your life is a sign that you're resenting God. The, uh, the Bible says this change of plans upset Jonah. He got very frustrated. He got very upset. He got ticked off. Now, this revival, when God said, I'm gonna forgive him, it's good news for everybody except Jonah. When God says, I'm gonna forgive the whole city, everybody's rejoicing except one guy, Jonah. Why? Because he's the guy who doesn't want him. He wants him to be destroyed. So he's frustrated. Second thing is anger. It says Jonah became furious. That word there in the Bible literally means he lost his temper. He's in a rage. He's livid. He is indignant that God did not destroy the people who had hurt him. Why didn't you destroy those people? And so he's, very, he's not only frustrated, he's angry. Number three, self-pity. When you have self-pity, often behind it will be resentment. And it says he complained to the Lord. And he goes, oh, poor me. Nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I'm gonna go eat worms. And he has a pity party and he invites me, myself, and I. Have you ever done that? Had a pity party for yourself? Oftentimes there's resentment behind that. Frustration, anger, self-pity. Now in the next verse it says this. Now, Jonah says, I ask you, Lord, please kill me. Huh? Please kill me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Oh, this guy's way off now. Okay, this guy is seriously, are you kidding me? This is extreme resentment. God, just kill me. I'd rather be dead than alive. Now, here are the two other things, depression and suicidal. Depression, it's better for me to die than live. That's severe depression. And suicidal, Lord, just kill me, okay? I, I don't wanna live. My plans didn't work out, so I don't wanna live. Just, you know, take my life. Now, how rational is this? Okay, this is extreme resentment, okay? Now, it's not rational because think of all the things that God has done for Jonah so far in his life. All the stuff he survived because of miracles. He survives a storm at sea. He survives being thrown overboard by those sailors that we looked at a couple weeks ago. He survives being swallowed by, by a giant fish. He, he, all these things have happened that he's still alive and he's going, I just want to die. I just want to die. Now, why is that? This is what happened when hate fills your heart. Hate filling your heart will cause these emotions. Resentment filling your heart will cause these emotions. And actually, they actually come in order. Because it starts with frustration, because things aren't going the way you want them to go. Then it goes from frustration to anger. I'm ticked at God because things aren't going the way I want them to do. Then it goes from there to self-pity, and I start feeling, poor me, poor me. 
And then it moves from there to depression. And then it could move to, I may as well just die. It progresses. That's what happens when you hold hate in your heart. I am begging you, as your pastor, I am begging you, whoever you're holding hatred against, whoever you're holding hurt against, whoever you're holding resentment against, let it go. Let it go. Because if you hold it in your heart, hatred in your heart produces, and and resentment in your heart produces frustration and anger and self-pity and depression and I, I, I remember many, 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 many years ago uh, uh, when Kay and I first got married, the first year, about six months into our marriage, we were not getting along in our marriage and we were fighting like crazy and we were like brand new newlyweds. Kay thought she was having a nervous breakdown. I ended up in the hospital. I literally was in the hospital. And, and, and I remember a psychiatrist came in. This is like 45 years ago. Psychiatrist comes into me and he goes, so um, what's your problem? I said, uh, well, I'm depressed. I'm depressed. He goes, so really, what are you angry about? I said, oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm just depressed. He goes, anger, depression is sometimes frozen anger. When you swallow your emotions, your stomach keeps score. And I was so angry at Kay, and I was swallowing it. I wasn't expressing it. I was repressing it. And it was causing depression in me. When you hold anger, when you hold hatred, when you hold hurt, when you hold resentment in your heart, you're not hurting the other person. You're just hurting yourself. You gotta let it go. That's a mistake that Jonah made. I I just wanna die. It always hurts you more. Now here's the second mistake that Jonah made. First is resenting God's plan when it doesn't fit my plan. I, I resent God because his plan doesn't fit my plan. The second resentment is resenting God's mercy and goodness to other people. When God is good to people I don't want him to be good to, then I get upset. When God is merciful and forgiving to people I don't want him to forgive, then I get upset. And that's what happened to this guy Jonah. Jonah hates that God is forgiving people he doesn't like. Then not only his political enemy, as I told you, he's racially prejudiced against these people. Jonah chapter four, verse two, it says this. Then Jonah complained. Now, who's he complaining to? To God. He says, didn't I say, he's talking to God, didn't I say before I left home that I knew you would do this, Lord? In other words, forgive these people. That's why I ran away to Tarshish. You know, he said, this is why I ran away from my life mission. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. I, 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 I know you're slow to get angry. I, I know that you're filled with unfailing love. I knew how easily you could cancel your plans for punishing these people. Now notice, Jonah says, I ran from God and I ran from my life mission. I ran from what God had told me to do because I knew what a good God he is. He said, notice the four things that God knows about God. He says, I knew you're gracious and compassionate. He says, I I, I knew you're patient. In other words, you're slow to get angry. God doesn't get ticked fast. He's patient, he's slow to get angry. He says, I I knew your love is unlimited. It's, It's everlasting, it's eternal. And he goes, I knew that you would rather forgive people than punish them. And all this knowledge, what does it do to Jonah? It depresses him. Really? Really, all these good things about God and Jonah gets depressed, why? Here's why, because Jonah had a problem that you and I have too. We want forgiveness for ourselves and we want justice for everybody else. Okay, we want to be forgiven. We want God to show us grace. We want God to show us mercy. But that guy who heard me, no, God, you get him. You get, he deserves justice. Do I deserve justice? No, I deserve grace. I deserve mercy. Jonah wants God to forgive him, but he doesn't want God to forgive anybody who's hurt him. And he's resentful. And he's resenting that God is actually showing mercy to somebody who hurt him. He's resentful that God is showing mercy and forgiveness to somebody he doesn't like, his, his enemies. 
and he wants forgiveness for himself, he wants justice for everybody else. So let, let's just get real today. Let's don't talk about this guy thousands of years ago, let's talk about you. Who do you want God to not forgive? Who do you want God to not forgive? Please don't forgive them, God. They hurt me too much. Who has hurt you so much that you don't want God to show them mercy? This is the Jonah trap. And it happens as much today as it did to this guy a long time ago. Who is it that hurt you so much you don't want God to show mercy? Who are you unwilling to forgive that God's already forgiven? God's already forgiven them, but you won't because you think you're better than God. You are only hurting yourself. You're not hurting them. Holding on to that resentment, holding on to that hatred, holding on to that hurt is not hurting them. All it's doing is making you miserable. Who are you unwilling to forgive that God has forgiven? I remember a guy came to John Wesley one day and he said, uh, they were talking about a guy and the guy said, oh, I could never forgive that guy. I could never, never forgive that man. John Wesley said, well, then I hope you never sin. Why? Because when you, you don't wanna burn the bridge that you have to walk across to get to heaven. Let me show you what Jesus said up here on the screen. Jesus said this, if you forgive others the wrongs they've done to you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive the wrongs you have done. Uh Oh, when you refuse to forgive, you're burning the bridge you have to walk across to get to heaven. If you're unwilling to forgive others, God says, why should I forgive you? If you're unwilling to show grace to others, why should I show grace to you? You want everybody else to have justice, but you want to have mercy. That is the Jonah trap. That is the Jonah mistake. You need to learn to forgive everybody who's ever hurt you for three reasons. Past, present, and future. Now listen very closely. Three reasons you need to let it go, no matter how badly. They, do they deserve it? Of course not, but you don't either. Forgiveness is never deserved. Forgiveness is never earned. Forgiveness is just a gift. You don't forgive them because they deserve it. You forgive them because you want to feel better. You do it for your sake. You let them off the hook for three reasons. First. I have been forgiven a lot in the past, so I need to forgive other people. Second, holding on to the hurt right now just makes me miserable. I end up thinking about people I don't wanna think about. And I'm gonna, in the future, need more forgiveness in the future, because I'm certainly not gonna be perfect from here on out. So I need to let it go for all three reasons. Past, I've been forgiven. Second, I don't wanna be miserable now. And third, I'm gonna need more forgiveness in the future. Friend, you gotta let it go. You, you, you gotta let it go. Not because they deserve it. You didn't deserve the forgiveness God's given you. You let it go because holding on to it hurts you. Now Jonah gets mad because God does good things to people who are repentant. And Jonah gets irritated because God shows grace to people that Jonah didn't like. You'd think he'd be more gracious. God had shown him an awful lot of grace for his stinky attitudes and his rebellion and all that. So Jonah doesn't want those people in Nineveh to be forgiven. He wants them to be destroyed. He wants the whole city to be wiped out. And God had said, I want you to go warn him so I don't have to wipe him out. I want, you, I want him to turn. You know, there's one other possible motive that Jonah has, and we see it in the Living Bible translation of Jonah chapter four, verse three, up here on the screen. Jonah goes, I'd rather be dead than alive when nothing that I told them has happened. What's he worried about here? His reputation. 
He said, God, you told me to go to Nineveh and go, in 40 days, the city will be destroyed if you don't turn, if you don't repent, if you don't come back to God. And now it hasn't happened. That makes me look bad, God. He's more worried about how he looks than people's salvation. He'd rather see an entire city destroyed than him look bad. He goes, you know, it's better for me to not even be alive. This makes me look bad. I'm, I'm worried about how I appear to others. Are you? Now, because of this, in the second half of this chapter, God has to teach Jonah an object lesson. And it's, a, it's one that we all have to learn. We're going to look at this. What should I remember when things don't go my way? Well, you need to remember four things. And that's what the last half of this chapter, this last chapter of the book of Jonah, teaches us. Four things to remember when things don't go your way. Now, things aren't going to go your way a lot in your life, so you need to write these down. And you need to remember, this is what I need to think about when things aren't going my way. When my plan doesn't match God's plan. Number one, first, when things don't go my way, remember, there are four things to remember. Remember, God can see things I can't. I just have to remind myself when things aren't going my way that God can see things that I can't. Joan is all upset that God had said, I'm gonna destroy this city if they don't turn to me. They turned to him, he said, I'm gonna let them off. He's upset about that. And in verse four, it says, then God asked Jonah, who's all ticked off, what right do you have to be angry over what I've done? Why should you be angry that I've forgiven these people? He's going, are you God? Are you wiser than me? Can you see things that I can't see? Anytime you doubt God's wisdom, you're gonna get in trouble. Because God is God and you're not. And when I have my plan, and all of a sudden God has his plan and God's plan is different than my plan and I start to get upset about it, I just need to remember God can see stuff I can't see. God can see the past and the present and the future all at the same time because he's not limited by time. We're on a planet that circles 24 hours you know, around the sun and rotates. And, uh, but we have a t- if you weren't on this planet, your concept of time would be very different. God is timeless. He can see the past, the present, and the future all together. He can see what you can't see. So you need to trust his wisdom. When we doubt God's wisdom, we get in trouble. God had to deal with this with a lot of people in the Bible, not just Jonah, another guy named Job. Look up here on the screen. The Bible says in Job 38, two and three, the Lord said to Job, who are you to question my wisdom? Where were you when I made the world? Not a bad question. Where were you when God made the world? Are you God? Do you see things he doesn't see? Do you know more than he knows? Do you think your plan is better than his plan? Where were you when I made the world, God says? He says, do I need your advice to change plans? No. Do I need to consult you when I know what's gonna be better for you? No. Are you being a little presumptuous? Yes. I said, I just need to remember when things don't go the way I planned, God is God and I'm not. And I just need to trust him and I need to trust his wisdom. I need to trust that he can see things that I can't see. On the screen, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11 says this. God does everything just right and on time. So he always does the right thing and he always does it at the right time. God's never late. We might think he's late, but God's never late. God does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what he's doing and see the whole scope of his work from beginning to end. We don't see what God sees. You trying to understand God's plan is like an ant trying to understand the internet. I don't have the brain capacity to see from beginning to end and see all of history, and you don't either. And and so the first thing I have to do is remember that God can see things I can't see. So God's saying, don't doubt me. Don't doubt me when you're going through tough times. I know what's going on. I can see where it's headed. I know the ending. I know the end of the story. I've read the last chapter. 
So he said, don't doubt me. Remember that God can see things I can't. So this is the first thing Jonah has to learn. Now, Jonah leaves the city, okay? And in the next verse, verse five, it says, then Jonah left the city of Nineveh, and he found a place east of the city to sit down, and there he tried to make a temporary shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Now, do you see what's going on here? Jonah is still hoping, even though God says he's gonna forgive the city, Jonah's still hoping God's gonna destroy him. And so what he does is he leaves town, he goes out up on a hill outside of town, and he sits down to watch the show. He's waiting for God to destroy the largest city in the world at this time. Okay, this is gonna be a good show. So he gets out there, and, and he's ready, and he sets up his long chair, and lawn chair, and he, he pours an iced tea and gets out his chips and guacamole, and you know, <laughs> He's waiting to see a city destroyed. He said, man, that's a little gruesome. How entertaining is it to watch people be destroyed, killed, and cities destroyed? Well, they're called blockbuster movies. <laughs> I mean, thousands of years later, people pay big money to go see cities destroyed and people killed. So he, he, he thinks, I'm gonna be entertained by this. So he's sitting out there in his chair waiting to see what will happen. The problem is, it's a hot, 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 dusty, deserty day and Jonah doesn't have a beach umbrella. <laughs> so he's getting hot. And that leads us to the second thing you need to remember because what God does next is pretty unusual. Number two, write this down. When I'm going through a, a tough time that I don't understand, what I need to remember when things don't go my way is remember God is good to me even when I'm cranky. God is good to me even when I'm cranky. Now Jonah, he's mad at God, but God's still gonna be good to him. And in the next verse, verse six, it says, talks about that even when your attitude stinks, God is still gracious to you. Verse six, then God arranged, Jonah's out there sitting under the hot sun, then God arranged for a broad-leafed plant to spring up quickly and provide shade for Jonah from the hot sun and to relieve his discomfort. This made Jonah very happy and comfortable. <laughs> Jonah's being a total jerk. God still cared for his discomfort. Okay, this is kind of cool here, okay? Now notice, this, then God arranged, circle that word arranged. It's the same word where it says God arranged a great fish. He custom made, he custom made a broad leaf plant to spring up quickly and provide shade over Jonah while he's sitting there. He's worried about Jonah's discomfort even though Jonah's attitude stinks. God cares about you, friends, even when you're a jerk. <laughs> and, and he's saying here that you have no idea how many times God has made your life comfortable when you didn't deserve it. You may have been going the exact opposite of God and God's still covering you with shade. You may have been ticked off at God. You may have been totally ignoring God and God was still caring for your discomfort because that's the kind of God God is. He loves you even when you're unlovable. He loves you even when you're unlovely. Here's Jonah mad at God for God changing the plans and going, I'm gonna forgive those people. He's out there and he's complaining about how hot it is and God takes care of his discomfort. I need to remember that God is good to me even when I'm cranky. And I need to remember that I have no idea how many times God has made my life easier when it could have been harder and I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it at all. It was simply the grace of God. Now here's the third thing to remember. When things don't go as planned, I remember God sees things I don't see. When things don't go as planned, I remember that God is good to me even when I'm cranky. And number three, when things don't go as planned, I remember that God is in control of every detail of my life. God is in control of every detail of my life. The big and the little, the large and the small, 
the fast and the slow, every detail in my life. Plans in your life, friends, don't fail randomly. I'll say it again. Plans in your life don't fail randomly. There is a purpose. There is a reason behind everything. Everything in your life. Now, God has to teach this lesson to Jonah. So he actually uses the object lesson of this plant that he's grown up to give comfort to Jonah. That God is in control of every little detail of my life. And in the net, you know, so God had arranged for this plant to spring up and provide shade while he's sitting out there waiting for the show to happen, the show of destruction. But in the next verse, it says this. But at dawn, the next day, God arranged, there's that word again, God is custom designing, God arranged for a small worm, oh great, a small worm to chew through the stem of that large, this is going to be an object lesson, chew through the stem of that large shade lesson, a shade plant, so that it withered and died. Then when the sun arose, God arranged, there's another word again, a scorching east wind. And the sun blared so hot on Jonah's head that he grew faint and he wanted to die and he said again, it would be better for me to die than to live. Okay, now so far we've seen God arranging all kinds of things in Jonah's life. Okay, he's arranged a fish, he's arranged a plant, he's arranged a worm. <laughs> God's using all, in fact, in fact, all, look up here on the screen. Here's all the stuff that God had arranged in Jonah's life. The Bible tells us in chapter one, verse three, God arranged a great wind to create a storm. Then it says in verse seven, God arranged the dice to reveal that Jonah was the problem. You remember that part of the story. Then it says God arranged a great fish to transport Jonah back to where he was supposed to be. Then it says God arranged a fast-growing plant to provide shade. And then it says that God arranged a worm to eat the plant for breakfast. It's all been arranged. Now I want you to listen to me. The things that you think are disappointments in your life, disappointments are his appointments. Disappointments are his appointments. Disappointments are his appointments. Disappointments, what looks like a disappointment in your life is his appointment. It may not be your plan. But God has a plan. God is God, and you're not. The more you fight God's plan, the more miserable you're going to be. And you're going to have frustration and anger and self-pity and depression and maybe even feel like taking your life. But if you go with the flow and you say, God, I trust your wisdom, and I trust that you're good to me even when I don't deserve it. You're good to me even when I'm a jerk. You, you give me comfort. I mean, I may be running from you completely. I'm still breathing air. I'm still drinking water. My heart's still beating. Those are all gifts of God. I wouldn't last one second without the grace of God, and you wouldn't either. So God has arranged everything from a great wind to a little worm. Now, I want you to get this. In your life, in your life, sometimes God arranges something really big to swallow you up like that big fish. He arranges a big circumstances to swallow you up and you're heading in the wrong direction and when you, it spits you out, you're headed in the right direction. At other times, God arranges something brand new that comes up suddenly in your life, like that plant that sprung up suddenly and provided shade and comfort when he was discomfort. And sometimes God provides something new in your life to give you comfort even when you're not where you ought to be. But God's given you comfort even in that situation. And then sometimes God arranges something small to eat away at what's been giving you comfort because he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants to move you. He wants to get you going. He doesn't want you sitting on the hill under the shade plant for the rest of your life. So he arranges something real small, like a worm, to eat away at your comfortable. And all of a sudden, it's not comfortable anymore. And you're back under the hot sun. 
in all of those situations, big, little, small, whatever, God is doing it in every situation, in every case, God's motive is love. He's doing it because he loves you. Not because he hates you, not to punish you, he's doing it because he loves you. God is a God of wisdom, God is a God of grace, and he's a God of love. And you may not see the beginning to the end, but he's doing it, whether it's the big or the little or the new in your life. He's doing it because he loves you. And he knows what will make you happy more than you do. You know, the word great is a very prominent word in this book of Jonah. I haven't called attention to it so far, but as we're ending this series, I want you to look up here on the screen how many times the word great shows up in the story of Jonah. It says that chapter one, God arranged a great wind. And then it says that the wind created a great storm. And then it says that the sailors felt great fear because the, the boat was breaking up. Then God arranged a great fish. And then it says Jonah got a great second chance. And then Nineveh showed great repentance, that city, and as a result, the city had a great revival. A lot of great things happen, but also a lot of small things. I want you to write this down. Write this down somewhere on your outline. God uses both great and small things to direct me. God uses both great and small things to direct me. Great circumstances, big circumstances that swallow me up, little circumstances like a worm that eat away at my discomfort and my comfort. God uses both great and small things to direct me, but God is a God of details, and he's in control of every detail of your life. So when things don't go the way I want them to go, I remember God can see what I can't see. I remember that God is good to me even when I'm a jerk, when I'm cranky, when I'm totally ignoring him. God's still good to me. And, and I remember that God is in control of every detail, the big and the little. He is arranging. It's all arranged. Disappointments are his appointments. Verse 9 then God asked Jonah again, what right do you have to be angry that the shade plant withered and died? Jonah said, I have every right to be angry, and I'm angry enough to die. <laughs> this guy just doesn't get it, okay? He just doesn't learn. This is what we're learning not to do, okay? Jonah totally misses the point. What's the point? Write this down. When things don't go my way, the fourth thing to remember is remember to focus on what will last. When things don't go my way, I need to remember to focus on that which will last. I remember that God can see what I can't see. I remember that God is good even when I'm a jerk. I, I, I remember that God is in control of every detail and I remember to focus on what will last. You see, you guys, we fret and we worry and we stew and we spew and we get upset over the passing of circumstances that aren't gonna last this week, much less next month, next year, 10 years, or for eternity. We spend most of our worries on stuff that is so short term, like a plant that grows up and dies the next day. And he goes, why are you worrying about this? He said, he said, if you're gonna get distressed in life, at least get distressed about something that really matters. Uh, plants don't last, they're short-lived. Some of you, you kill them really quickly <laughs> at your house. You're really good at killing plants, okay? You don't have a green thumb, you got, I don't know, some other kind of thumb. But the bottom line is, he's saying, if you're gonna get distressed about something in life, well, at least get, get distressed about something that matters, that's gonna last. You're all worried about a plant that grew up one day and then I let it die the next to teach you the brevity of life, to teach you how most of the stuff you're worried about isn't even gonna matter a year from today. It's just temporary. In verse 10 and 11, it says, then the Lord said, Jonah, you're more concerned about a plant that died 
even though you didn't plant it, you didn't water it, you didn't make it grow. In other words, I did that. And plants are short-lived. They spring up quickly and they die. But Nineveh, that city over there, the one that you wanted destroyed, has more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. I'll explain that in a minute. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't, shouldn't I be concerned about that great city? Now, now, Bible scholars debate what is meant by 120,000 people who don't know their left hand from their right hand. Some scholars think it means children. 120,000 kids, they don't know the right hand from their left hand. So there'd be 120,000 kids in, in that city. Others think it means the people there weren't morally astute. They were morally ignorant. They didn't know right from wrong. And as a result, they were living in a wrong way. Either way, God is saying, Jonah, you care more about your own comfort, this shade thing, plant that died, and you got ticked that it died in a day. You care more about your own comfort than the salvation of a city full of people who are spiritually dying. Why don't you get concerned about stuff that really matters rather than simply your own personal comfort? Now, I'm not going to make a big point here, but God wants us to care about cities. He says, should I not care about that great city? If God cares about cities, we should too. What city should you care about? Well, obviously the one you live in. But God says you should care about all cities. Why? Because they're filled with people that God created and made and loved. The future of the world is urbanization. The future of the world is cities. By the end of this uh, century, the vast majority of people in the world will live in major cities. That's the migration. The future of this world is young, urban, and south of the equator. That's the future. Study any demographics, they'll tell you that. That's the future. There will be cities of 85 million, like Kinshasa and, and uh, Nairobi and others. Giant, giant cities. He's just saying we, we need to care about cities. Why? Because people are there. Let me just phrase it in another way. What do you care about most? The plant that's given you comfort or the salvation of people that God created and loves and wants them to know him? I mean, what if this Christmas you cared more about the salvation of the people around you than you did cared about what you're gonna buy them as a gift. You're gonna spend an awful lot of time thinking about what am I gonna buy them for a gift this Christmas? That's temporary. Most of those Christmas gifts aren't even gonna be around next Christmas. It's, it's, the, it's the plant that's gonna die. What, what if you spent as much time praying for that person and their salvation and inviting them to a service as you did spending time on what to buy them as a gift. You got your priorities in the wrong one. He says, if you're gonna get distressed, get distressed over something matters. People need the Lord. They need the Lord a whole lot more than they need a Christmas gift. And yet, why are we more worried about the temporary? The greatest, this, this whole series has been on your life mission. The greatest use of your life is to invest it in something that outlasts it. You see, you can waste your life, and there are lots of ways to waste it. You can spend your life, there's lots of ways to spend it, or you can invest your life. And the greatest use of your life is to invest it in something that will outlast it. Focus on what's gonna last. What's gonna last? There are only two things on this planet that are gonna last forever. This building isn't gonna last. The United States of America isn't gonna last. Starbucks isn't gonna last. There are only two things that are gonna last forever. The word of God and people. God's truth is eternal. It'll still be true a million years from today. If it's true a million years ago, it'll be true a million years in the future. God's word is true. So it's gonna last forever. And there's only one other thing that's gonna last forever. Oh yeah, people. One of two places, heaven or hell. And what we do with our time now may determine their eternal destiny. 
So if you want to invest your life in something that's going to last, invest it in the Word of God and in people. Get this book into your mind, into your heart, and get people into God's family. And in heaven, people come up to you, thank you, I'm, I'm here because of you. I'm eternally grateful. I'm here because you cared enough. You cared more about my salvation than my present. This is the message of Jonah. This is your life mission. Let me just end with a couple verses up here on the screen. Matthew 6, Jesus says this. Don't worry. Don't worry about will we have enough to eat or drink or wear. Because only people who don't know God are always worrying about those kind of things, the temporary things of life. He goes, your father in heaven knows what you need. He knows you need what, you need something to eat, something to drink, something to wear. He goes, your father in heaven knows what you need. So instead, focus on putting God's work first and doing what he made you to do. That's called your life mission. Focus on putting God's work first and doing what he made you to do, your life mission. And here's the promise, God will make sure that you have all these other things that you need as well. I'm gonna take care of your needs. You don't have to worry about that. If you're gonna worry about some, worry about your life mission. Worry about putting God's work. Worry about doing what God wants you to do. Last verse on the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter four. We fix our eyes, that means we focus our attention. We, we, we fix our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. Because what we see will last only a short time, but, but what we cannot see will last forever. You can see this cup, but it's not going to last forever. It'll eventually deteriorate, rust, and it'll fall apart. You can see this table, but it will eventually fall apart. This building will eventually crumble. Everything you see on the earth is temporary. It's not going to last. What's going to last are the souls of people, the word of God. The eternal is invisible. He said that's the stuff that matters. Let's bow our heads. Father, you made each of us for a mission. You didn't put us here to live for ourselves. We don't want to waste our lives. We want to make our lives count. Thank you for all these lessons from Jonah on what not to do. Now you pray. In your mind, say, say something like this to God. Say, God, help me to remember that when things don't go my way, help me to remember that you can see what I can't see. Help me to trust your wisdom. You know how it's all gonna work out, and I don't. I wanna trust your wisdom in my life. And God, when things don't go my way, help me to remember that you're good to me even when I'm cranky. And that there have been many times in my life that you've taken care of my discomfort and I didn't even realize it. You were being good to me when I was totally ignoring you. Sorry. Help me to remember that you are always a good God and that everything you do in my life, you do out of love. God, help me to remember that you're in control of every detail, the big and the small. Help me to remember that the disappointments are his appointments, your appointments. And Lord, help me not to worry about stuff that's not going to last and not going to matter. Help me not to worry and get stressed out over temporary stuff. But help me to focus on what's really going to last. Your word and your people. Today I'm committing the rest of my life to discovering and developing and fulfilling the purpose, the mission that you made me for. Jesus Christ, come into my life, into every room in my heart. 
fill me with love and confidence. I need your forgiveness. Help me to forgive those that have hurt me. Help me to be as gracious with them as you are with me. And Lord, today, that person that's hurt me, I am letting them go. I know I'm gonna probably have to do it over and over and over till it finally feels right, but I'm letting them go. I'm letting them off the hook because you've let me off the hook. Thank you for your grace and forgiveness to me. And Jesus Christ, I wanna follow you from here on out. In your name I pray, amen. God bless you.